Welcome, everyone. This is the second in our series of workshops on the topic of direct experiences with student activities for learning statistical concepts. We had our first in this series last week with an introduction to the concept of confidence interval. Today, my colleague Beth Chance is going to lead an activity that introduces students to inference for one proportion. Beth is a professor of statistics at Cal Poly in San Luis Obispo. I should have introduced myself. I'm Alan Rossman. I'm also a professor of statistics at Cal Poly in San Luis Obispo. And Beth will be leading you through this activity today. And I will, I will be quiet there. And thank you all for coming and turn it over to Beth. Thank you, Alan. So as Alan said, I'm going to lead an activity on one proportion, and we're going to use a context about whether dogs can smell COVID, but I want to emphasize that there's lots of different contexts that you could use here. So I'm going to try and emphasize the structure and how I develop the activity if you want to change the context. And I'll give some pros and cons to some different contexts as well. So I want to talk a bit about the development process and what I feel are some of the more critical decisions you need to make and some that are maybe less critical. But I want to spend the bulk of the time today having you kind of work through or us go through together with an activity as I use it with my students. And I really want you to kind of put your hat on of what would this feel like for me? If I was a student in this class, what would I like to see more of, less of? Where am I struggling? What's working? What's not working for me? And I think that will be helpful to you if you decide to do an activity like this yourself. And then I hope to leave some time for discussion, but I will warn you, I do need to leave right at the top of the hour to go teach a class. Uh, so I encourage you to interrupt along the way as well if you have questions or want to discuss something. Um, if you do go to the uh, website for our project, and I think I can put that in the chat faster than Alan, um, you'll see some links to some of the materials. One is a pre-lab, which Alan sent out in advance, and that is like I would do with my students, as I would expect them to have completed that before we start that class period. There's also a Word file or a Google Doc. You can open either one, but I would like you to use the student version. If you're using the Google Doc, you'll need to make a copy first. So that is how I often um, send that out to my students. And then I have them make a copy. They add their answers, and that'll be what they submit for the assignment as well. We are going to be using the one proportion applet, and there is a link in the document for getting to that. And then there is um, another set of documents, which I'll call the teacher's guide. One is the same Google Doc, but it has more notes, guidelines, discussion some of which I'll hope to cover live today, but you can look at that later to see what I, I missed. Um, and then this activity is an alternative to one from the Stub website. So we talked about that briefly last week that we put together a bunch of resources, mostly aiming for a biology focus, but they're freely available and often with Word files. So you can take them and modify them freely if you want to use them yourself. And then at the end of that document is another pre-lab and also an example of a quiz I might give after this activity. And I'll talk more about those as we go along as well. Um, the learning goals for this activity, and I am trying to get better at always putting those at the top of the handout so students know that and I can refer back to it. One is just applying the six-step process. So I'm envisioning this activity is coming either very early in the course or kind of the first time they might see this inferential reasoning all put together, or even just a small one-day activity just to help them see another way of thinking about statistical inference, or I've used it with very young students, or I've seen people use it with in like a parent-teacher night, just to give parents an idea of what's going on in the class and what their students are learning. As we said, this will be a research question involving one binary variable. When we first decided to start with one binary variable, just because it's so much simpler, we didn't think there'd be very many interesting research questions, and it turns out there are quite a bit. Um, so hopefully you'll get a sense for that today as well. And then we will be introducing the logic of statistical inference using simulation-based inference. So just to give you a little bit of background and what I have done before in my class. So this is typically the end of the first week of class. So maybe we've done one day on an introduction to randomness. Like I might do that through Money Hall, which I'll talk about in a later session if you're interested in. But the main point of that activity is just defining probability and how I want them to interpret probability in this course as a long run relative frequency. So we have talked about that for about a day. And then maybe another day on just what it means to be a distribution, looking at some interesting distribution distributions, looking at some graphs, thinking about shape, center variability, and introducing some terms that I literally use probably every day the rest of the course, which is observational unit and variable. 
And I really want them to practice on that. And you'll see why today I think that's so important to help them distinguish different distributions and what they're supposed to be talking about and looking at in these distributions. And then I wanted to give this activity as one I might do with my students in class. Um, but I mentioned in the pre-lab that I kind of alternate between a more traditional classroom setting and maybe an entirely lab setting. And so this, what I'm gonna model today is maybe more what I would do in class with the students all together. And then the next day they would go and do a lab activity where they're working much more independently with, or with a partner. And I'm just walking around and answering questions. And so you'll see kind of a mix of both of those things here. So then between, say, days three and four is when I would have assigned that pre-lab to be completed before the next uh, lab period. And I have several goals with these pre-labs. Sometimes it is just to watch a video or just to read some background, just to get them familiar with the study so that they have that familiarity and we can start immediately talking about what do they do well, what do they not do well, you know, kind of critiquing it, but not spending a lot of time on that so we can get to analyzing the data. And then actually, I kind of move my focus a little bit to later in the course, I might even ask them, do a few calculations or maybe try this in the technology, because where I want to start us together in class is this part later along in that six-step process. So I want to make sure they always see that six-step process with every investigation, but I might make the entry point a little bit different depending on where I am in the course. And then I do think the pre-lab has an important role of let's make sure we're all in the same place with some of the new terminology we've been learning. So observational unit and variable would definitely be on this first pre-lab and they have to apply it to this new study. If I've introduced the term statistic and parameter, I might be having them practice that on the pre-lab as well. And so just the aim is to try and scaffold what they're doing outside of class. So I have a bigger chunk with them in class to focus on the new content. And this is an example of a different pre-lab than what I sent you, because it is, a, again, maybe a teeny bit later in the course, one or two days. But I do tend to do these pre-labs as multiple choice. And then I pull it up at the beginning of class, and we can see how everybody answered together. So students who were not getting all the right answers can see that they're not alone. There's other people not getting the right answers. And then it helps me know which ones I need to talk about more in class before we start the new material. Um, and there's a few that maybe are numerical, maybe one that I would make open-ended and I could even, sometimes I make it do an hour before class and then I can take that hour to review their answers or pull out a really good student answer model for class that day. But you'll see it's a lot about what did you learn in that video or that reading and how you apply the terminology we've been using to this new study. So then hopefully we're all on the same page to talk about the study. So this is going to be a study on, um, I used to use dog sniffing cancer, and that's where a lot of the news um, media articles or videos, um, if you searched online, you probably found a lot of those. But I do think, I, I wanted to say, I don't really make my students go find their own video. I would give them one, but I wanted you to see some of the variety of the video possibilities. And I think a short snippet just really gets them engaged in the context. And since COVID, I'm sure you can find one easily about uh, detecting COVID as well. And so they give the dogs these five specimens and the dogs just go down the line and sniff them. And then they're trained to sit next to the one that they think has the cancer, the COVID, from a breath sample or a sweat sample or something. And then they test the dogs multiple times. So then they mix up where the specimen they want them to detect is. They give them a reward, like a ball, tennis ball, if they get it right. And so you may get a set of 20, 30 trials of the same dog to look at. And so there's a lot of opportunity there to talk with the students about why do they move it around where, where it is, maybe get them thinking about this idea of independent trials, maybe not even using those terms, thinking about, you know, what's happening if the dog's guessing, and um, can we generalize these conclusions beyond this one dog? And that's something to get them thinking about early on. And those are questions that I think students find engaging and, and get them into the context pretty quickly. So now I wanna to go to the activity. So for you, um, if you have the PowerPoint that we gave you here, there's links, or if you're going again back to this website um, or the resources, I would like you to go to either the Word file or the Google Doc for the student version. And then just on the Google Doc, you just have to make a copy and then you'll have your own version and not overwriting anything. But the Word file is gonna be a blank version and then I'm going to pull that up here. And again, this is how I would do it in class where they have those learning goals or those reminders of what we've been doing, an opportunity to ask questions and what we've been doing. And then a little, this is going to be about 
uh, Maika, and she had 47 out of 50 trials. Um, and again, I'll talk a little bit about this choice of example. It's very interesting. I think students will find it engaging, but I think there's a few reasons maybe not to use this example to hope we get to along the way. Um, and as I say, there's another version of this, and there's also a lab version of this if you're interested in that as well. So hopefully that gave you enough time to get into the activity. So I will ask you in the chat to identify some of these terms for us. And some of these are ones that you saw on the pre-lab, and I think that's fine too. You know, students can go back to that and see, I meant to say with the multiple choice, then I can often say, here's the right answer and here's some comments on some of the good answers and some ways you might've been thinking incorrectly on the wrong answers. And then hopefully they can learn from that and apply it in this thing that's gonna count again um, towards a course grade type thing. So anybody want to volunteer either in the chat or even unmute on observational unit? Each trial, that's a very good answer. That would actually take my students a while. So what are some hints or what do you think a student might say that would not be the best answer? What do you think is a common student mistake? Yeah, they often just say the dog. And so how I respond to that is, well, how many observations do we have? Or how many data points? Or if we put this in a spreadsheet, how many rows are we going to have? And they'll say 57. So I say 57 what? You know, I try and convince them that we don't just have one observation. We have these 57 observations. And so they should be thinking about the trials. And that can be a little bit um, difficult for students to think about that as observational unit. Uh, one thing I have done recently is purposely making this singular. So it is one observational unit because they start to say 57 trials. And then I don't always know if they're thinking of that 57 trials as one observational unit versus the individual trial. Um, so that's also a reason why this might be a good example is to get them used to that idea and this idea of repeat observations on the same individual. And again, pros and cons on that. So then what's the variable that we're measuring about each trial? Um, whether they identified the correct specimen. Yeah, so correctness or incorrect, um, whether or not they... Micah got it right. And I do want them to say this in their own words and have some flexibility in those interpretations. But again, thinking that as a question that's posed to each individual trial. And by now we've probably talked about categorical and quantitative, uh, maybe even binary, or I might introduce it now as just any time a categorical variable only has the two categories. I said, if this is maybe more like day four or five, we've introduced the idea of a statistic. And at this point, I might still be letting them tell me either the 47 or 47 out of 57, or even converting that to a proportion. Um, I actually find it's worth a, a, a sentence on the difference between a proportion and a percentage and why I want them to be consistent on that. Because in later formulas, if they start plugging in percentages, that's going to cause problems. And so I do try and be a little picky about that. Um, but I probably am not even introducing symbols for the statistic at this point. And then this idea of a parameter I found is much trickier for them. And so I do try and maybe introduce that a little bit earlier in the course so we have more opportunity to practice with it. And I think this is a context which makes it even a little bit more tricky to define the parameter. So given that, feel free to give me a wrong answer or a right answer to a parameter. Proportion of correct IDs for all possible attempts. Um, and I might even start, as I say, my students could use some review or practice with proportion. So I might say the proportion of all possible attempts. And that idea of all possible attempts is something I should do a better job of. Um, getting them to think about, you know, there is this infinite universe in this case. So suppose we could observe this dog forever. What would be that long run proportion? So we can go back to that earlier work we did on probability and how we want them to define that. So I like this idea of all possible attempts. Um, and then maybe something like where Micah is correct. Or I would be okay with, you no know, AI just came in and got rid of all your answers. <laughs> Probability. 
of correct identification. Again, I want them to say it in their own words. So I want them to write it down and then I want to give them feedback to correct things that I do see wrong. Um, again, something students might do wrong is they might say the proportion that Micah answered correctly and something that's just a little too past tense. And so that's something I want to talk to them about pretty quickly. And then, yeah, this idea of a population, maybe back to this all possible attempts, I think that's a little bit tricky here. I tried recently talking more about, well, maybe this is more of a random process, kind of like coin tossing rather than a population, but that doesn't really work with the students so much. I think all possible attempts is really a good population to try using with them here. And I think keeping the parameter about a population can be really useful here. And then I have students take a minute and make a bar graph. Um, Sometimes I would kind of skip this. You know, I want them to see it. I don't, it doesn't have to be the prettiest graph ever. So some kind of scaling. And so this isn't something that's usually hard for them. They may be coming to you having heard bar graph used for other types of graphs. Um, so it is a bit of a definition of what I mean by a bar graph. And then getting them used to the idea of don't stop at the graph, but summarize what you learn. So I want them thinking about, you know, this big majority that we saw that Micah was correct. And so something I have been doing most recently to make this activity, this part be a little bit more interesting, is the idea of an active title. And just getting them to think about what would be a good title for the graph and what we mean by an active title. And I have been sometimes go into chat GPT and say, what do you think an active title is? And so it talks about how not just saying here's a graph or not just saying here's a bar graph and maybe not even saying Micah's results, but maybe even a little bit more interpretation or something back to the research question. So something like Micah's right a, a huge fraction of the time or, you know, not always correct, but there does seem to be a tendency and you don't want to make it too long. That's going to be part of your summary, but you do want the title to kind of draw the reader in and tell the reader what you want them paying attention to in the graph. And again, this is a tool that I'll use more often later in the course. I'm just trying to get it started early on. And I think as much as an activity like this, that you can think of things that are the most important to you to be able to come back to later in the course. Those are what you should be emphasizing now. So then do the results convince you that dogs can detect COVID? Explain your reasoning. And again, I would ask them to talk amongst themselves or think pair share. And maybe I should be doing more to designate which of these activities have an exact right answer, which of these questions and which ones I just want you to think about it for a few minutes. And I just want you to conjecture. And conjectures are supposed to be wrong. And, and actually, you'll learn a lot more if your conjecture is wrong, because you'll remember it and you'll think back to it a little bit more. And But I do encourage, I do try and pull out students to give me an argument either way. So some students might say, you know, 47 out of 57 seems pretty convincing because that's a lot. And that may be as far as they can get right now. Some students may say 47 out of 57. Well, 57 is not very many. And so I would really need a much bigger sample size before I could be convinced. Or some might feel, you know, she didn't get them all right. What, what, what's, what's up with that? You know, maybe there's some reason why she got some right and some not right. And maybe it has nothing to do with COVID-19. So I just try and, and list a bunch of those out and get them thinking about these ideas, not necessarily saying some are better or worse than the others, just that there are these multiple explanations. And in fact, I sometimes, again, might put this more on the board than in the handout, this idea that there's two possible explanations. Um, and so we can maybe eliminate some other things like, oh, Micah always goes to the one on the right. Well, because they randomize, that's not always going to be the right one. And so if she's getting it right more often than you'd expect, you know, one explanation is she has this genuine tendency. Or it's always possible, and I get to say, blame it on chance. If you're not sure, it's always possible she just got really lucky. And we need to decide if we can kind of refute that argument. Um, so I do like setting up these two possible explanations as, again, is something we can do multiple times throughout the course. These are going to turn into a, a null and alternative hypothesis, but they don't know that yet. But I just want them thinking about we need to decide which one of these we think is the more plausible explanation. And again, I do spend a little bit of time on possible versus plausible versus probable. I don't like the fact that I have to spend that much time on which word you're using there. But I think here it's important that they understand the distinction for this could happen, anything could happen, versus this seems more believable to me. 
versus I'm not making a probability statement here. It's not like sometimes Mike is guessing and sometimes she's not. She either has this genuine tendency or she doesn't. So I don't really want to make probability statements. I'm just trying to see based on the data which of these explanations seems to be more consistent with Micah's results. So just trying to model that language for them as carefully as I can. Um, so yeah, if she doesn't have the ability, then perhaps she's just guessing. And something that I've started to do very recently is just this idea of a model. And so I want to form a model. So what would a model be? My model here is going to be like a guessing dog. I want to compare Micah to what a guessing dog might look like. And so you might think about um, having a little conversation with them about what you mean by a model, because that's going to come up a fair bit when we start doing the simulations. And we're just really understanding the distinction between the real data we saw with Micah and this idea of a guessing dog is something we could also perhaps get some data about. So E, I gave you maybe two ways to phrase the question. <laughs> Suppose a friend thinks Micah just got lucky. How would you convince your friend otherwise? Or how likely do you think it is that Micah would be able to get 47 out of 57 correct if she was simply guessing? So we're going to start off with the second explanation and see if we can argue against it. And here, I think it would be really interesting to have students talk with each other a little bit about how they might convince somebody that Mike is no, not just guessing. And we do have some, some videos in our resources where uh, Nathan Tintel goes through an activity like this, and you can see the students talking, and then he's able to call on one or two students, and they give a really nice explanation of how you might do this. Now, that example is a 50-50 for the guessing dog. And so the students volunteer, well, you could toss a coin and you can see how often a coin might land 47 out of 57 um, in, in one direction. And they can start to get a little bit more intuition based on what they already know on, on how that's likely or unlikely. But just, again, this idea of letting a coin toss represent, say, a guessing dog or, or something like that. So, again, I would encourage them just to, to think together with a partner on how they might answer that. And then we do kind of tell what we're going to do. Um, and so people used to worry, well, if you're giving them the answer right here, what's going to encourage them to spend some time answering your question up here? And Alan always gave the best answer. Like if them reading ahead is my worst problem in the course, then I think I'm okay. Um, and if a student's really struggling, then this might give them a little bit to, to think about as well. And so we're going to model Micah's choices corresponding to this second explanation using simulation. And again, simulation is a word I used to think they understood, but maybe takes a minute or two to talk about that. So now I'll ask it up to you in the chat again. Can you suggest a method for modeling Micah's results, assuming she is just guessing which one is the COVID specimen among the four each time? And one vote for spinner, any others? Flip a coin, cards, four-sided die, two coins, excellent, right? So why two coins? Either Micah, I mean, why not just one coin? Either Micah gets it correct or she doesn't, right? So we need to model this idea of four specimens and let's double check this particular study uh, was one out of four. So we don't want to model 50-50. We want to model, if she's guessing, we want something where she would be right, say 25% of the time, all right? So yeah, maybe something like a spinner where you could make 25% correspond to a correct identification and 75% being incorrect. And I admit it, I don't start with this one. I do start with a, a coin and I do have my students do the coin tossing. So I also start with a much smaller sample size. I start with a study that's only 16. And then I do have students toss a coin 16 times. And we can talk at the end about, should it be one coin 16 times? Should it be 16 coins? Um, what about nowadays when students don't carry coins? Is it okay to have them ask Siri on their phone to toss a coin for them? Or ask Siri, you know, generate a, a number with the probability one fourth correct? Um, and I actually 
don't know that they get quite as much out of letting the technology do the tossing for them. And so with a spinner, you can actually make a real simple spinner. You don't have to really give them any tools. They can draw a close enough circle and with their 25% and you just need paper clips and they can put the paper clip right in the middle, flick it, and they have a spinner. So it's really easy to have a class of spinners if you want them to do this. Um, and you could have them do it multiple times to get up to 57. Again, I would probably do this with a much smaller sample size. So here I would do it with maybe just five trials just to collect the data from them. And we'll talk a little bit about why I might do that. And then they would spin 15 times. So you said, do you want 25% for success? And we probably have the conversation at this point or maybe the next day about really doesn't matter which one you call success and failure. You just need to kind of identify it. And so then they would set up that spinner. They would do their five spins and then they would each come to the board and they would uh, put an X by their number of successes. And then we'd have that graph to look at. So I'm going to try and replicate that a little bit here. If you want to scroll down a little bit and you can go to the one proportion applet and we can talk about these applets a little bit as well. Um, one thing I sometimes do is you can pass information into the applet. So here I'm actually passing something language zero, which is the same thing that should happen now if you follow the link at the bottom that says spinners. Because um, if you don't do that, it puts you in the coin tossing setting. And my goal with the applet is to make the computer look just like what they were doing as much as possible. So we're going to set this up to be 25% successes. We're going to just do five, and then we're going to draw samples, and it's going to show me spinners. And so I want them to realize that that's doing exactly what they did, just maybe a little faster. And we're going to build up a distribution just like we did in class. Right. And so once they kind of believe what's going on here and what these dots, you know, they're dropping down this time, I'm going to have one success again. So that's going to drop down to a one. So I, I spend some time on making sure they understand what's going on in this graph and then maybe even turn off show animation and you can start to populate a lot more. But I do like how they're individual dots. And I do like asking them the question, like, what does one dot here represent? I used to ask what's an observational unit in this graph, but that was a little bit too hard for them to have observational unit refer to two different things in the same study. Um, so now I may be asking, what would you do to add another dot to this graph? Well, I'd spin five more times. And I think by having gone through that experience, hopefully that's a little bit easier for them. And then, well, what's the variable on this graph? So number of successes, say, if you're using that as your statistic. Um, and I really want them to be able to think about that. So when we do make some probability statements, I want them to be able to say, well, the percentage of time, meaning these sets of five spins, would I get, say, this many number of successes? So again, trying to tie that back to what we did two days ago on just defining probability and really thinking about what's the random process that's being repeated over and over again under identical conditions. And then you can increase the number of samples. And of course, students will struggle at first on the difference between sample size and number of samples. Again, I might build this up gradually. But then I start to say, you know, when does this graph kind of stop changing, <laughs> right? Maybe I've done enough. And this idea of, you know, how many times do I have to do this? Well, once, once your results aren't really any different. And maybe you could even be looking at the mean and the standard deviations. Like, yeah, I have a pretty good idea about what this distribution looks like. And then taking the time to stop and talk about that distribution. So I did forget one thing. <laughs> so I was going to make you all do this once. And so maybe if you want, go back and just hit one sample and just do one more if you want with the animations. And I'm going to open up a poll question um, where you're going to tell me how many you got in your one set of five spins. I'm catching up on, on the chat and all the methods that you talked about. Um, and there's a lot of variety and I would encourage that. We don't have to all simulate it the same way. Let students pick their own way of how they simulate it and just really, really reinforce uh, 
this idea of as long as I match the 2575, that's all that really matters here. All right, speaking of not changing much, I'm not seeing much new come in. So I'm going to end the poll. And I didn't realize that Zoom did this now, but you should all be able to see the graph, right? There's a bar graph, right? Or, or a histogram if you want, but discrete, right? Showing those results. And again, this takes some time and having the students come up and put their dots on the board takes some time. But I think if you can choose those experiences judiciously for the ones you really want them to remember. So when you are going back later and asking them what this graph represents, they're like, oh, how is that dot right there? Right. By being one of those dots, hopefully that helps them kind of internalize the experience and make it more meaningful for them. And then, yeah, you can see that even with only I think this is 37, 40 results, we still get a pretty good idea of what that distribution looks like. And we can answer questions like would getting four correct in only five attempts be surprising? And they can already start to answer that. Whether you're looking at your results or looking at, I have 2,500 results here, they can start to say things like, you know, four is kind of out there in the tail of that distribution. It's a little unlikely. So you might not have thought four out of five would be so unusual, but remember, go back, this was a situation where it should have only been one out of four. And so it doesn't take much for four or five to be kind of unlikely. All right, let me get rid of that and go back to the handout, all right? And we do have them kind of write down how they set up that simulation. Again, this is something that if you do a lot of the simulation, you'll want to get them in the habit of kind of documenting or planning what they're doing for that simulation. Um, definitely reinforcing that not everybody got the same result. Here I would have been talking about the guessing dog is what happened in the applet. And just this idea, yeah, there's this chance variation. It's random. Right. So it's random, kind of how many they're going to get right. And there's going to be some variability just due to that randomness. We knew for a fact that this was a 25% dog, but there's still going to be some sample to sample variation in those results. So again, language that you might want to use um, throughout the course. And then you could have them replicate the graph down here. And as I say, I would mostly want them to tell me what the label down here needs to be. All right. So this idea that now my quantitative variable is that number of correct identifications for the guessing dog and keep reminding them that this is all in that world where you knew for a fact, where the computer knew for a fact that it was 25% to 75%. Um, maybe even have them look at the graph and approximate the mean. So before you show it to them, think about how it's going to be right around one, which I would expect um, for, you know, if I'm going to be right one out of four times and I ask five times, it makes sense that the mean is in that region. Um, and then would you consider it surprising for Micah to correctly identify the COVID specimen? So again, I would start with a small, smaller example, but this might be a way to give them a scaled down version. Let's understand this process. And now let's see if you can ap apply this process to the real data, which is the 47 out of 57. And as much as you can, you know, ask them to make those changes. And as much as you can, have them predict first what's going to change. So really thinking about what do I need to change in here? I'm not going to change the 0.25. I'm just going to change the 57. I'm going to show uncheck show animation because I don't really need to see all those spinners. And then thinking about what's how's that graph going to look different, right? I really shouldn't have said that. But thinking about what's going to be different about the graph. So you can already see things are going to scale a little bit differently. Think about maybe where the mean's going to be. Think about maybe what the shape's going to be. Maybe talking about spread, things like that. Um, and again, I might start just a few at a time just to start building up that distribution. And if you don't want to even see that, you can check hide spinners. And this still gives you the most recent results um, if you want to have a little bit of an indication. Sometimes you can still see a blue dot on here that corresponds to the most recent results. But now I'm up around 1,000 again. Seems to not be changing appreciably. Um, and so that would be the distribution of a guessing dog. If I gave a guessing dog 57 attempts, 57 trials, many, many times, right? So I have lots and lots of sets of sets of 57 trials where I knew for a fact that it was a 25% chance of guessing correctly, of being correct. Okay. And it's 
beautiful, it's symmetric. You can see that it's kind of centered where you might want it to be centered. And that actually takes some work to think about 25% of 57. So I might switch over to proportions by this point, once you're working with more interesting, larger data sets. I don't know, I, I do it over a couple of days. But it's also interesting to ask them what's gonna change about the graph. And having them see that toggle of, well, no, it just rescales that horizontal axis. But now my mean is gonna make a little bit more sense. My mean should be close to that 0.25, all right? So fairly soon I'm having them work with proportion of successes rather than number of successes um, to answer questions like that. Um, another thing you'll notice, well, okay. So that's a pretty graph, am I done? That was applets doing what it's supposed to do. You want me to go home now? Like, why did we do this graph? What am I hoping to learn from this graph? Need to compare our results. What do you, how weird is 47 out of 57, right? So this graph tells me nothing until I go back to the actual research study. This was telling me what the guessing dog does. I need to now decide does Micah behave like a guessing dog? And so I need to know where 47 out of 57 is on this graph. And that's where number successes might help a little bit more. 47 is nowhere near this graph. Um, and so I would probably be happy with that at this point, is I would just say, look, 47 is not on here. So what does that tell you? And, and I think you'll notice in the handout, and I apologize for I'm not writing down anymore, right? Go back to those two explanations, right? Does this still seem to be a plausible explanation? Is it believable that Micah just got lucky? Over here, something that happens less than one in 1,400 times, right? We could keep doing this. We're never going to get anything near the 47, right? So getting them to use that language. And I'll even have this kind of be the last question of the assignment is, how would you explain this to somebody else? Again, using your own words. But if you get stuck, go back to this picture and just tell me what was going on in this picture. And so just by describing this picture, they've answered that correctly and they've used the right reasoning for statistical inference. And so I really want them to kind of have that written down as their own explanation. Um, and and just, you could give them a little bit more help. It's just, you know, if that 47 out of 57 is just so unlikely, you don't think it could have happened by random chance, that's gonna be your evidence. And so again, introducing the idea of evidence rather than proof, that's gonna be your evidence that, um, pretty convincing evidence that this is, not a good explanation. So the only one we had left was that Micah had a genuine tendency. And again, this will get more complicated when you have more complicated studies. It's like, well, I've eliminated all the other explanations. The only other one left is that there really is this genuine tendency. And I do try and phrase it as this idea of a genuine tendency or that she would consistently get it right more than a guessing dog would, more than 25% of the time. So I'm not claiming she'd get it right all the time. You need to caution against them using words like proof for being too absolute, but just this idea that this is better than what a guessing dog would do. Um, how much better? Well, that's something we'll need to learn a little bit more statistics to decide how much better or go back and watch Jen's video on, you know, maybe then come back to a confidence interval. So what do you think her probability is if it's not 0.25? And that would be some good follow-ups to this. Any other questions? Questions on this? All right, then let me show you the teacher's guide I didn't want you to look at. <laughs> um, any advice on making sample size versus number of samples intuitive? That's a great question. I mean, I think that one is a little bit through practice. Um, one thing I do is, you know, there's always a very specific number I'm looking for here with sample size, whereas this is just some large number. And my, I, I asked an exam question last week where they had to fill in all these and they just could put any large number here. And so the fact that that number is not specifically important, maybe that helps. You're just trying to get that long run, um, behavior, um, and then I think the fact that it may be in this first experience, they had to do it a specific number. So they do learn pretty quickly that that needs to match what was done in the study. It's more getting them to realize that this number is not all that important um, and talking about that. Yeah, and this applet does still talk in terms of samples. There's some other versions where we talk about repetitions. 
Um, but then I find that gets a little confusing with repetitions and trials and samples is language we'll use a lot later. Um, so that's why I maybe have switched back to that a little bit. Um, so yeah, so showing you what else is in here. So what's in blue is some of the commentary that hopefully we went through today. Here's a little table that this might be a good point in the course to introduce as well. But I said students maybe need a little bit more help with the idea of model or simulation. Um, and so again, this distinction between MICA and how that translated to a spinner, and again, reminding them how the 57 trials corresponds to the 57 spins and how we know this probability for the guessing dog, but that this is what we're, is unknown to us. And that's kind of the only distinction between these in trying to decide if MICA behaves like a guessing dog. Um, if you don't want to do the tactile simulation of class, again, I think it's very, very much worth the time, at least the first time. You could have them go into the applet and just do one uh, repetition <laughs> themselves and pull the results that way. But I think the tactile is worth it before they get onto the technology. And I still have students who think this technology is just a black box. And so just trying to step through that as uh, one step at a time as much as possible and replicating what they did in the tactile simulation as much as possible. Mm -hmm. And then, and then I might also go back to, again, that six-step process and how we've kind of done all that, right? We thought about the research question. We thought about what they could have done better with the data collection or what they would have done, you know, differently or why they made certain decisions. Exploring the data, which is just a bar graph right now, but even getting at count versus proportion um, and how that doesn't tell you everything. You might want to try and make some inferences beyond the data. And then how you can formulate the conclusions and how you can back up your conclusions with evidence. And then we try and ask another question like, well, what would you do next? Does this apply to all dogs? You know, maybe we should see if this replicates ac across other dogs and, you know, asking some of those follow-up questions and realizing it's never one study and done, but usually a study is generating that many more questions and maybe something they would be interested in investigating themselves. Um, this is the variation that's on the stub website, although I took a few questions out um, and added just a little bit of commentary, but not as much. But again, this is maybe coming a little bit later. And so maybe you start introducing the terms null and alternative hypothesis. But notice how they've stated the null and the alternative in questions five and six, and then we define them. And I find that a more effective for my students than giving them a definition first, but you know, having them kind of build it up and say, oh yeah, I'm lazy. I don't want to write that all the time. I'm just going to call that the null hypothesis, things like that. Um, but again, just applying it to the real research study as, as soon as possible in essence. Um, another thing that I do in the lab activities where they're a little bit more on their own is I literally throw in a stop sign and say, you need to either show us your answer here or ask a question here if you have one, or I go over and try to be more proactive and say, you know, what did you say to that previous question? So finding those checkpoints where you really want to make sure everybody's together. Because if you give them, you know, I give them 50 minutes, they'll keep going, even if they don't understand the last 45 minutes, right? So making sure you do have that ability to answer those questions quicker, even if they're not asking them directly. Um, and then as you've probably guessed, this would be really easy to start introducing a p-value. And you're gonna ask how I talk about the p-value instead of just finding the probability of 47, why do I find the probability of 47 or more? So what we do in the applet is we put the observed statistic and we would count, so it adds it on there. Notice if you now switch to proportion, it'll do that conversion for you, all right? So that's another, you know, get them to go back and forth, whichever is more convenient for them. Um, and then we talk about how this is sometimes called a p-value. And maybe that's my only advice is it's just a definition. My goal is to figure out how extreme this observation is in this distribution. One way to do that is to find that probability. Um, if it was a little bit more interesting situation, I'm gonna try and have a non-zero value. <laughs> right? Um, there is now a feature in this applet where you can find the probability at exactly one number. And maybe you can get them to think about, well, if I have a big enough sample size, any one of these is going to end up with a pretty small probability. So by taking that tail region, it's a way to compare one distribution to another across very different sample sizes or whatever. And so that area gives us something that's a little bit more comparable. And so people have decided that if that area is less than 0.05, that that seems to be far enough out in the tail of that distribution. 
The other thing I do is pretty early in the course, we talk about another way to measure how far out in the distribution you are is to see if you're more than two standard deviations away. And again, that's just kind of a little heuristic, just like 0.05 is kind of a little bit of a heuristic. Um, so that's a definition, just another way to say, yeah, you're out there, you're in the tail, you're a little bit unusual. Um, and so that would work the MICO if you can say, oh, that's six, eight standard deviations away, then that's really even more evidence than just getting the small p-value or not seeing it on the graph. Shouldn't say more evidence, maybe more compelling to the students or something that they can relate to a little bit more. Um, so I just, again, say there's different ways we could measure how unusual it is. The p-value is one way that happens to always do it as a tail probability. Looking at two standard deviations is another way. Um, and they're, they're not, they're just different ways of looking at the same thing and trying to get them comfortable with those pretty quickly. Um, and I'll answer the next question I just saw. And so we do give them this chart, but again, try and emphasize what I most care about is this last bolded item that the smaller the p-value, the stronger the evidence. Report your p-value, let somebody else decide, right? It's not just a yes, no, black and white decision that you're making. So this is again, maybe more of a class activity. This is another, this is the multiple choice. So I did put some answers in there. This is maybe a post quiz. So you can see how we might assess somebody's understanding of this. So it's a new research study, but then apply all the things you just did, parameter versus statistic, give you a graph, make a decision, um, maybe even think about if you've done p-value, right? One thing I like about this question is it's not just yes or no, but the reasons, and there's good reasons and bad reasons that can support either the yes or no. So making sure they can put both of those together. Um, and then by this point, maybe I'm doing an interpretation of a p-value. And then, oh, not here. So let me go back to the workshop activity page. Um, oh, maybe the link's not here. Sorry about that. Oh, I know where it is. <laughs> back to the slides. Uh, just to show you what's here, here's a lab. So this is what I do in one of those labs days. And so I do try and make it as kind of self contained as possible. So ideally students could sit and do this on their own. We're together, they do it with a partner, but it is mostly them doing it. I'm just, as I said, answering questions as they come up or trying to be a little proactive here and there. Or if a student misses a day or during COVID, you know, that I really felt these got to the point where students could kind of self teach a little bit. And so you'll see some of the things that we've been talking about. And so, yeah, I do, um, students get a Word file and that's what they submit. They copy and paste screen captures from the applet into this report. Um, one thing that is nice about the online kind of version is I can put the instructions in the applet right here instead of having to go back and forth, you know, maybe scroll a little bit to see what to do next, but it's all right with each other. Um, and then they just take a screen capture of this. So we teach them how to do that. So I do have rubrics on some of these labs if you would be interested. Um, so let me go back to... Well, let me ask you to address a question in the chat. Do you collect the activity from the student? If so, do you grade it? If so, do you have a rubric? So the rubrics are more for the labs. And so to be honest, if I am doing an in-class activity in a lab, an in-class activity in a lab, I only collect the labs. And sometimes I do tell them in advance, I'm only going to grade these questions, but I often grade a lot of them. Um, but that is where they do their writing and I do try and, and grade their writing. Um, some classes I do more with the post quiz than with the lab. Um, and then I always, I sometimes don't make the lab do the next class period so that we do have a more traditional classroom setting if they want to ask questions on the lab before it's due. So generally it's due before the next uh, lab. Um, so they have a couple days on those. Did that answer the question? I think so. Thank you. Yeah. And and you'll see a decent amount of overlap um, between that in-class activity and the lab. So I maybe, here's a model. Now I want you to do it in this new study. Oh, maybe the last two questions are a little bit something new or something to think about. Um, so I do want them to have that writing. And then I forgot um, what I was going to say. The labs are... Um, available at a different website. We'll, we'll put a link on, on this website to send you back to the labs as well. Um, but that particular lab is in the same. Um, and then what I find is having them do a pre-lab and having them do a lab activity outside of class 
is a much more scaffolded, directed activity versus read this chapter. And so I don't have them do much reading at a class. A lot of that is built into the pre-labs. Um, maybe some, and then, you know, I tell them in advance, the lab is going to build on this. And so sometimes they can get to the lab without the reading, or sometimes they have the, at least that reference material if they have questions on the lab and I'm not getting to them quickly enough. And then by collecting these two labs a week, I don't do a lot of kind of traditional book problems anymore. I might give them some or give them some self-practice on, on in our course management system for additional practice, um, but I tend to focus my grading time on the labs, on the written explanations. Um, so choice of context. So I said a little bit about pros and cons of this one. I think this one was so highly significant. I sometimes wonder if that's good or bad. I mean, it was, if you're going to stop at the graph, then that's probably good because everybody would look at that graph and say it never showed up. Right. And then maybe you could find something that's not as extreme as a way to motivate why you need to do the simulation. Like people might have looked at 47 out of 57 compared to 0.25. I don't need to do anything. I know that's going to be unusual. And so when you make something that's maybe not as obvious to them, then that motivates, well, here, we need to do the simulation to decide. And so you can think about that a little bit as far as the choice of the first example and how significant it is. Um, I have another example I love, which is the does is yawning contagious from the Mythbusters. And I, I give them fake data at first that is less confusing before we go to the real data that they thought was meaningful that isn't. <laughs> um, so as long as you make that distinction for them. So I'm always trying to put it in context. I'm always trying to find contexts that are meaningful to them. And I do tend to start with a significant result more than an insignificant result because that I think is a little bit harder for them to get their reasoning a little bit. We don't want them thinking that because I got something that was in the middle of the distribution, sorry, um, that's evidence for the null hypothesis, right? And so that's something I want to make sure we have plenty of time to talk about. Um, and so where you could do a small scale version, or you might start with a smaller sample size if you're going to do the tactile version. Um, and I do think pretty early on, you might want one that's data you collect on them or about them or something, just because, you know, one of your earlier answers was we need to see where our data is. Well, what do you mean by our data? Well, yeah, the, the data, the results. Okay, well, you have different results. These are results, or these are the results you're talking about. And then, especially if you give them a number and they make up a bunch of numbers, how are they supposed to know this one's real and these are simulated? And But if it's data about them or a number they've come up with, maybe that'll be more real to them and help reinforce to them what needs to go in this box. Because that's usually what happens when I'm walking around those labs is I'll see, well, I changed all my data, sorry. Um, you know, a distribution that is heavily shaded. And I'll know that they've put in the hypothesized value here rather than the observed sample results. And so that's another uh, early mistake that I think is easier to get rid of if it's the data is more meaningful to them rather than I just say, here's a study result. Um, and then just key features um, you know, as much as you can highlight the reasoning you want them to use, as much as you can minimize the terminology and symbols, especially if this is the only a standalone activity, or especially if it's the first time through, my guideline would be to choose the language carefully that is going to be meaningful to students. So maybe things like, what are the could have been results? What could have happened if the dog was just guessing? Or, you know, what if the dog was guessing? What would those have looked like? And I don't always carry those all the way through, but maybe just initially something that they can kind of gravitate to that helps them distinguish between the actual study results and these simulated results that they've um, just generated. Mm -hmm. And then, yeah, as much as you can do all six steps as possible, starting with the research question, the beauty of the simulation is they can answer the research question in one class period, even if it's the first time they've ever done anything like a p-value. And so the activity I've shown you here is pretty much a 50 minute class period comfortably. Um, in fact, you can you know throw out follow-up questions for them to think about afterwards as well. And then in the slides, I think there's a few more resources here than 
what's on the, the web page. So you can download the slides and get them. There is a guide. I put the date here because it is getting a little outdated. There's some new features I haven't put in, but this is supposed to give you some of the nuts and bolts of all the applets. Um, and feel free to contact me if you have any questions at all or want any changes, right? That equal sign is something somebody asked for. And, and we that's the beauty of being able to manipulate these applets, especially as I'm designing an activity. Um, I can say, I want it to do this. Uh, and there is a set of how-to videos, um, and this list will be growing as well. And so if there's something in particular you want, feel free to let us know. Um, so that's just me talking through at my rapid speed on some of these applets, but you can slow it down there. Um, other spinner applets that are out there, other examples really related to this activity. Here is my lecture notes um, from this class. And so here's another way you can get at some of the labs that we've been talking about. And I did have to move some of these over to a different website. So if you find a broken link, just let me know. Um, but you should see. And, and also just the progression of how I build through these lab activities. And then this is a little article that came out, I think, last year about how if you only had one day, one class period, what might you do? Okay, you have two class periods. What might the second or the two-day combination look like? Um, so that's in Statistics Teacher if you're interested. And that's all I have. And I left two minutes for more questions. <laughs> Thanks very much. We do have a couple minutes for questions. Remember, Beth has to teach her own class at 10 minutes after the hour, but, but we have a couple minutes here. And I may also put my email up here as well, too. A 95 confidence interval for the dog okay. in the chat. Thank you. <laughs> Why didn't you tell me that before I was guessing all those numbers? Questions, <laughs> comments, reactions? Before you start to leave, let me remind you, we, we do this again the next three Fridays. We have Jill Vanderstoep next week talking about comparing two groups with a quantitative response. So Maroy, the week after that, talking about correlation and regression. Beth, we'll be back on March 1st with the Monty Hall problem. I did remember one other thing. On these, when I am able to write in the activity, I save this and post an annotated version for the students as well. Questions, comments, reactions? That was great, thanks. I, uh, I, I do something similar with the um, smelling Parkinson's disease data. Mm -hmm. And I like this one uh, for the fact that the uh, the population proportion isn't a 50-50 thing, because a lot of students think everything is 50-50, you know, it, everything in its complement, the probability is 50-50. Yeah, and there's a great quote from an earthquake expert on what was Nightline then. It's like, yeah, we're either going to have an earthquake in the next 30 minutes or we're not. So yeah, it's 50-50. Yeah. So yeah, I do like starting with 50-50 for the tactile simulation, but I would move beyond 50-50 pretty quickly and make a big point of it and why we need a different simulation. And so then when we get the quantitative data, why we need a different simulation. Mm -hmm. it's just about the top of the hour, so we should probably stop there. Thank you all for coming very much. Thanks very much to Beth. I will send out by email a link to the recording of this later. Next week, I'll send out a link to the Zoom link for next Friday's session. Thank you very much, everyone. Have a good weekend. Thanks.